want you to welcome Pastor Donald Schott. He is usually hanging out in the drum cage or behind the scenes serving. He busted out the sports coat for you guys today. He is looking awesome. Come on, you can do a little bit better than that. Come on, Journey Church. Hey, man, thank you, Pastor. Am I on? Did I turn on? You, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, I'm just making sure. Hey, I want to do something I just love to do, and I want you to repeat something after me. And here's what I want you to do that. I want you to kind of half-hearted attempt here. I want you to repeat this so loud that maybe we can wake up the people that are asleep in the apartment complex down the road so we can let them know there's some church going on up in here this morning. So are you guys ready? Repeat after me. Salvation is free. Salvation is free. It costs me nothing. But following Jesus, following Jesus will, cost will cost me something. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. Amen. Well, that's good because most of us have figured out by now that, you know, following Jesus sometimes just isn't an easy thing to do all the time because there's some trouble and trials involved in the life of the believer that we have to go through sometimes in difficult times. And if you're like me, whenever those times come around, you think three things. Well, I had, I had two fingers. I got to get three up there, right? Why me, why now, and what good is ever going to come out of this mess? And those are the things that I personally think about because so many times we're just not sure what to do whenever trouble prevents itself. And one of the best books that I know of that helps us to understand the trials and the trouble that we go through is the book of Peter. First Peter particularly. And so before we dive into our text today, I want to give you some context as to why Peter actually wrote this book and who he was writing it to. Because he wrote it to a group of believers back in AD 64. Now, if you know anything about Roman history, this is a period of time when Nero was the emperor of Rome. You talk about a wicked dude right there. I mean, you remember you've heard about the Christians that were fed to lions and stuff? Nero. I mean, in fact, Nero was so wicked that he actually had his mother killed and his wife just to instill fear in the people back in that time. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? But not only that, Nero had an insatiable idea and a desire and a hunger to build things in Rome. The problem was Rome was so crowded at this time. And so in order to build things, he wanted to burn down just a little part of Rome. You've all heard of the burning of Rome, right? So Nero has some of his Roman guards set fire to Rome. But the problem was, here's what he didn't anticipate. This was a time when the summer winds were kind of racing through Rome. And all of a sudden, man, it caught fire on those wooden structures and it just set ablaze. And by the time it was all said and done over a period of six days and seven nights, over 70% of Rome burns to the ground. So the thing that was that there were some eyewitnesses and they saw that the Roman guards had actually set fire. And so they knew that Nero was up to this. They knew that Nero had done this. And so these people were ticked off, man, because they had lost their livelihood. They had lost everything. And so Nero begins to fear that he's going to be overthrown. So he goes into a damage control mode, just like any good politician would. And he has the word spread that it was those Christians that did it. And so people begin to believe that. And you talk about fake news. <laughs> the modern day media didn't come up with fake news. Nero did. In fact, Nero founded the NFNN, the Nero Fake News Network. And so because of all that, man, Christians were beginning to scatter. They were running for their life, man. They were running from those jaws of those lions because it was getting crazy in that day. So the question becomes now, what does what happened back there in AD 64, what in the world does that have to do with us today? Actually, a lot. Because Peter is writing this book here, and he encourages us and he reminds us that it is actually possible to walk through anything that life throws our way with a confidence and while looking ahead and complete confidence that God is in control. So are you guys ready to jump into our text today? Say amen. All right, that's great. I'll take it. We're going to look at 1 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, go turn it to 1 Peter chapter 1. If you've got your Bible app, dial it up. Whatever you got will work for me. And we're going to read verses 3 through 9 today. But I'm only going to focus on 
two verses, but I wanted to kind of read verses three through nine so that you, uh, you know, get the full scope of what Peter is encouraging us. So starting at verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Who's he talking to there? He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to all of us there. Verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, in this you rejoice. In other words, everything that he just got through saying about our salvation that is incorruptible, we inherit it. He goes, in that you rejoice. Okay, get ready because here we go. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which, by the way, is more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Would you bow your head and pray with me? Lord God, we come, Father, we pray, Father Lord, that you would just honor your word today, God, and instill it in our hearts, God. Lord, what your word is about to unfold to us is amazing. God, if we would only have the faith and the confidence to apply these truths in this text today, God. We'll see you do amazing, great things in our life and to help us walk through anything that life can throw our way. Lord, would you bless the reading of the word? Would you put it in our hearts? And you help us to put it into action most of all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, more than likely, none of us will ever have to walk through the kind of persecution that is being talked about here back at A.D. 64. But today, I do think that we have developed what I call trouble vision. A lot of times when I'm in marriage counseling, I talk about trouble vision. And what I mean by that is you, you've heard of tunnel vision, right? Well, trouble vision is a lot like that. It's having a narrow scope of vision or a narrow scope of understanding of the purpose of the trial that you are going through. And all you can do is just look at the event itself. That's trouble vision. And so many times we have that trouble vision right at the beginning of whatever it is we're walking through. And the first thing that enters our mind is, what am I going to do? It's really the wrong question to ask. So the question does become then, well, and it's the age old question that we always have. Well, why does God allow bad things to happen to his people? I mean, when something happens to those mean people out there, you know, we're real quick to throw the Christianese out there. Well, they reap what they sow. They're getting what they deserve, right? I mean, we're real quick to think things like that. But what about the faithful? What about those people that love God? Why them? I mean, why us for that matter? But when we look at the Bible, when we really examine our text today, we're going to find many perspectives today that's going to help us to understand why God allows trouble in the life of his kids. And our text today really offers us some very important perspectives that we're going to really need to know about. And not only that, we're going to need to hold on to them. Now, I want you to understand, first of all, that our text today will not answer every question that you're ever going to have about the trials and trouble that you're going through in life, okay? Okay. But it will provide a very crucial framework for understanding that there is a purpose involved somewhere, somehow, in the trial. So first thing I want you to notice today, let's look at verse 6. I want you to notice the word trial right at the end of verse 6. Let's focus in on that for just a second. It says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. You see, the Greek word for our word trial is the word parasmos. And that's an interesting term in the Greek because it actually means several things. It can mean trial. It can mean test. It could also even mean temptation. So depending on the context, it can have either a positive or a negative 
connotation. It just all depends. And so maybe you're thinking, well, you know, wonder if it's God that actually does the tempting and testing. Well, we're going to look at that in just a second and find out. But here's the thing, and here's this word this could get really messed up. And I want you guys to listen to me really carefully because I don't want you to misunderstand me. The same event can be both a test or a temptation. It just all depends. For example, God may use it as a test for us, but Satan can also use it as a temptation. How does that work? Well, we may turn to God in a trial whenever trouble comes our way. We may turn to him in deep prayer or Satan can use it as a temptation to cause us to be bitter. Any of you ever, ever became bitter when you're going through it? Anybody? Am I the only one? Heads up. <laughs> Whenever we're going through a trouble, we may go through a deep season of deeper trust in God and even fasting through it. Or Satan can use it as an opportunity for temptation so that we begin to complain about it and gripe about it. You ever co complain when you're going through a trial? Heads up. <laughs> Satan just tossed a grenade right in the middle of your deal. Man, that should be a sign of, of a wake-up sign to us. We may learn a completely and whole another degree of trust in God when we're going through trouble. Or we may turn from him altogether because it makes us so angry and so mad. Or we may even rebel from him and, and stay away from him for many years. The point is, it's the same event in all three of those cases. The same event, but there's vastly different results. It all depends on how we respond. So the second thing I want us to see in verse 6 today is a phrase, in this you rejoice. That's, a, that's an awesome phrase because if you take the root word of the word rejoice, which is what? Joy, okay, and let's think about that for a second. I mean, what is joy? It's kind of a hard word to define, isn't it? Well, we know that joy and happiness, they're two different things, right? Everybody on the same page? Joy and happiness are, are completely two different things because, you know, happiness kind of depends on a circumstance, right? And it kind of comes and goes depending on, you know, the emotion of the moment. But joy is much deeper than that. Joy is much more profound. Why? Because it comes from God. See, I want to put this up on the screen to you. Joy is the ability to face reality, the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, the, the positive and the negative. Why? Because we're most satisfied with God. So when we see things in that light, there's no contradiction between joy and trials. It's not an oxymoron to use them in the same sentence. They belong together. It's like butter and popcorn or Cool Whip and pumpkin pie. Whoa, man, I had some of that last night. Made me think about trouble and trials. <laughs> but the, here's the deal, guys. Faith without being tested is no faith at all, is it? And our text today provides some very important truths about the troubles in life. Number one, our trials are Brief. Look at it. Because Peter begins by assuring his readers that their trials would only last for a little while. Look at verse 6 again. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, of course, that little while can seem to go on forever, right? I mean, you get cancer or your loved one get cancer or some other debilitating disease, and I, I'll assure you that trial will last for a long time. It seems like it'll go on forever. Or maybe if you lose your job and you can't pay your bills, I assure you that trial, it's not going to seem like a little while. So then the question becomes, well, in what way could Peter possibly mention that, that our trials would only last a little while, that they would only be brief? And the, answer, the only answer that I could possibly come up with is that Everything in this life is brief when you compare it to eternity. Amen? It's all a matter of perspective. For example, three minutes doesn't seem like a long time, does it? 
But try holding your breath for three minutes. You'll start counting seconds really quick, man. Your cheeks are going to get red in your face. I mean, that three minutes is going to last forever. Stephanie and I, we, we've been going through a trial since 2003, ever since we moved back from Costa Rica. Oh, it gets better at times, but then it comes right back, you know. So the question is, then, what was Peter talking about there? Well, the point is, you know, our trials may last for days. It may last for weeks. It could even last for decades. But when you see it against the endless ages of eternity, even the worst trials that we're going to go through are brief by comparison to that. See, our problem is that we develop this kind of spiritual nearsightedness. And we count this world as the real world. And we count it as nothing compared to eternity. And by the way, God never asks us to deny the harshness or the reality of our trials. He only asks that we take on his perspective as we're going through it. But you know what else? Not only are our trials are brief, but our, also our trials are necessary. Yeah, our trials are necessary. Note how Peter uses this one little phrase in verse 6, if necessary. Verse 6, he says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, comma, if necessary, comma, you have been grieved by various trials. So I love the one-word Bible study. It's something I learned about 15 years ago. It's where you look at one word at a time within a Bible text, and you go back to the original language, and you dissect it, man, and you exhaust it, and you get every little meaning out of every little word so that you understand why that word was put in that sentence. And so when I did that, that little word, if, right there, man, it, just, it kind of just blew me away because it says, if necessary. Because see that little word, if, it indicates a need, obviously, the way it's used within the sentence structure, it, it has to. It means that there must be a necessary purpose involved in this. And the thing is, none of us are exempt from trials, right? I mean, some go through more, some go through less. Some people hardly go through any trials at all. And I hate those people. <laughs> Drive me crazy, man. They'll fall in a bucket of dung, you know, and come out smelling like a rose every time. I'm going, like, man, that's ridiculous. It didn't happen to me. But do, some do. But some have more, some, some have less. But those trials, guys, they're there. They're necessary. They help us to grow spiritually. They increase our faith in God. And maybe nobody's ever told you this before. But those trials that we go through, man, they're surefire proof that God is watching you. He's paying attention to your life. And he's doing things in your life, and he's redirecting you to get you to where he wants to go for his glory. And, you know, what do you think Peter is telling us if necessary? It all makes the point. He's saying if necessary, God's going to send you a little something, something your way because he's watching you. He knows what we need. And you know what? That should not surprise us. How do we know? Let me chapter and verse that for you. 1 Peter 4.12, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to what? What's his next two words? Try you as though some strange thing happened to you. See, many times those trials are like guardrails. Man, we get going down, we're doing our own thing, you know, and it, you know, it may not be a bad thing, it may not be anything wrong with that, but all of a sudden, but, but God said, that, that's not it, you're getting way off. And so he sends something our way, we hit the guardrail, we get back, you know, bounce back onto what God has for us. And he redirects us onto his path and his way for our life. The third thing I want you to look at today is not only are our trials are brief, not only are they necessary, but our trials have purpose. Absolutely, our trials have purpose. Now we've arrived right at the heart of Peter's message to us today. Verse 7, because trials come so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So notice that one little phrase there, so that. You need to circle it. 
If you have your Bible, you just circle, underline, highlight it, do whatever it takes. Because I'm telling you, there's no more one phrase that's more important in our text today than that one little phrase, so that. It is huge. And so here's how this works in our life. We get up in the morning, we set our alarm, we get up in the morning, we go to work so that we can get a paycheck, right? We get a paycheck so that we can pay our bills, pay our rent, pay our mortgage, so we can have a house over our head and and for our kids. We have a house and a thing over our heads and, and have a place for our kids to go to school to so that they can get an education, They get an education so that one day they'll get a job. They'll get a job one day so that they can move out of the house so that you can become an empty nester. Amen? (laughs) That's how it works. My point is, guys, so that ensures us that our trials and our troubles have a purpose And even though we may not see it at first, because many times we don't, our faith can survive if we are confident that a purpose really does exist in this. Many years ago in 2000, uh, no, actually in 1998, we were, uh, Stephanie and I were preparing to move to Costa Rica on the mission field. And there was a missionary couple that was in Jacksonville at that time. And and so we made arrangements to meet with them, to ask them questions. They had been in Costa Rica for many years. And we thought, man, I can learn a lot from these people. And so we had lunch with them. And it was just a great time, you know. And he asked me, well, where are you guys going to language school? I said, well, we're we're moving to northern Costa Rica, which is uh, the province of Guanacaste. It's the most poorest and most remote part of Costa Rica. And I said, man, there's hardly any churches up there. There's a lot, a lot going on. So we feel like God's called us up there. And he goes, that's, that's pretty cool, man. He goes, but, but where are you going to get the language school? And I said, well, there's a language school up there. I've already checked it out, and uh, you know, I've already signed up for it. And he said, well, man, he goes, I know a guy that's been teaching the Spanish language for 25 years to missionaries. It's actually his ministry. He's a Costa Rican, and uh, he's just awesome, man. We went to school with him, and, and he's just probably one of the best that there is if you want to learn the Spanish language. And he wrote his name and number down to it, and I looked at the name that he wrote down, and it said Marcos Cairol. <laughs> And honestly, it didn't mean anything to me because I already, I'd already been to Costa Rica many times. I'd been to San Jose quite a few times. I hated San Jose. It was so crowded, nasty. I told Stephanie, I will never live in San Jose. So but I knew this guy was in San Jose, so I just kind of shot it down right there. After they left, I just threw the number away, to be honest with you. <laughs> I ain't moving to San Jose. Forget that. So in 2001, we moved to Costa Rica. And there was a local church there we had already established relationships with. And we were going to church one Sunday, and there was an American missionary there. It was just so awesome just to find somebody that could speak English because we didn't speak any Spanish, you know. We're just walking around like, you know, clueless all the time, faking it like we know what we're doing, you know. And, and so we were just having a great time with him, and he gave us his name and number. So if you guys ever come up to San Jose to buy supplies, which is pretty much where you had to go, he said, why don't you just come on and see? He ran a big children's orphanage there, a children's home. He said, you guys can see the home, you know, and we can show you around. We'll just have a great time of fellowship. And that way you won't have to drive all, make the six-hour drive back in one day. And so he gave me his name and number. Well, about a week later, we're getting ready to go to language school one morning. And we get up only to discover we've been robbed. And Stephanie always put her purse right by my side of the bed because I'm, oh, back then, at least, I was a super light sleeper. I mean, I, I would hear leaves hitting the ground outside. We, did, we didn't have air conditioning, so we slept with the screens open or the, the windows open. And, and so we got up, and, man, her purse was gone. And I said, well, maybe you left it out in the living room. You know, maybe you just thought you put it there. And she goes out there, and all I heard her say was, oh, no. I'm like, what is up? You know, I walk out there. And I was dumbfounded at what I saw. I mean, in Costa Rica, all the houses have bars and razor wire. I mean, theft is rampant. You can't stop it. You try to slow it down a little bit. If you live in Costa Rica, it's not a matter of if. It's not a matter of when you're going to get robbed. Now, if you're going to Costa Rica, tourists, okay, you're pretty safe. I don't want to freak out. Okay, I don't want the tourist ministry in Costa Rica. They do. Back off. It's okay. You're okay. But if you live there for a length of time, sooner or later, you're going to get robbed. And so when I walked out there, all the houses, and and they have burglar bars and razor wire all over them. And I walked out there, and they had cut the bars off the house. Not only that, they had taken the windows out of the concrete opening. And I'm looking at, they're on the ground, and we're watching the curtains just blow in and out the window. I'm going, 
How in the world could they possibly cut those bars off, take the window out of the opening, and not wake me up, come right beside me and grab Steph's purse? How in the world could they do that? And so we were just scared to death at that point. You couldn't call the police because there aren't any in that part of the country. I mean, what was I going to do? Call, hey, we just moved here and got robbed. They are probably, well, welcome to Costa Rica. Everybody gets robbed. <laughs> so we went and got our landlord next door, and we showed her around there, and I showed her the bars and the windows on the ground, and she just didn't even act like she was surprised. I was like, well, that's weird. And she took us around to our bedroom window outside the house, and she showed us two slits in the screens. She goes, what they do is they slit the screens with razor blade, and they stick their arm in over your head, and they spray ether and knock you out. Dude, when she told me that, if I wasn't already freaked out, cold chills just went down my spine. They could have done anything they wanted to. We even, we even heard of another missionary couple that had the same thing happen to them, and they literally stacked them up in the living room like Lincoln logs just to show that they could do anything they want when they want it. And so we were so freaked out. So needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. I stayed up all night. The very next day, I stayed up all night again. I hadn't slept in 48 hours. I'm just so freaked out. The third day, Steph says, you know, you got to get some rest. So I'll stay up. I said, okay, but if you hear, hear a leaf drop out there, you wake me up. And so she stayed up. The fourth day, I'm looking at Steph. I'm going like, we, we're not doing this. I can't do this. Let's go down the road and let's get in a hotel. It's a pretty safe place. I said, let's just kind of, you know, get some rest and let's just kind of wrap our heads around this and try to process this. And, and so we did that. The very next morning, I got up before the sun came up and I grabbed my Bible and I walked down to the beach. In fact, it was this very same Bible right here. I walked down to the beach and I just sat there, nobody around me. And I was just looking out the horizon. I'm just shaking my head. I'm ticked off. You ever been angry at God? Anybody ever been angry at God? Am I the only one? I was, I was ticked off, seriously. And I was just sitting there and going, God, I just sold my business. I just sold my house, my cars, everything that I ever wanted. And I watched it go away in three different garage sales. And I moved my family here and just our sole possessions of six suitcases. And you let this happen? I came here to tell people about you. And I was so ticked off, man. And I, I, I only really know what all I thought. But I just sat there and I just opened my Bible. I wasn't turning to anywhere particular. I just plopped it open. And I just happened to look down and my eyes were fixed on James chapter 1, 2. <laughs> and it said, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. <laughs> that made me matter. <laughs> I go, are you serious? I'm going, joy, joy, this is not fun, Lord. I'm scared to death, and I'm about minutes away from getting my family on a plane and head right back to Jacksonville because you can have this stuff. I'm not doing this. And I just kept focusing in on that verse. I actually kept reading it over and over and over again, knowing that God's word's true, and there must be something to this. So I, st I was probably on that beach for probably an hour. I went back to the room, and I went inside, and I got Larry's phone number, the missionary that we had met the week before, and I said, Larry, uh, something terrible has happened to us, and I need to, I need to know if the invitation still stands. Can we come stay at the children's home with you? i got to talk to you about something because I don't know what to do. And he said, sure, man, come on. So we went there, and I told him about what had happened, and uh, I told him the language school wasn't working out. It was just way over my head. It was really more of an advanced language school. It wasn't for beginners like myself. And I told him, I said, man, I'm struggling. I'm scared to death. I said, I don't know what to do. He goes, well, let's start here. He goes, I know of a guy that's been teaching the language for 25 years. <laughs> and when he gave me this guy's name and number, it said Marcos Cairol. Now, Costa Rica has about 4.3 million people. Three years prior, a missionary gives me that same guy's name. God sends a trial to me, and I go to another guy, one guy in you know, 4.3 million people, and he gives me the same name and number three years later. We begin to go to that school and learn under Marcos. Remember I said I'd never live in San Jose? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> Careful what you say. God seriously has a sense of humor. 
We moved to San Jose and started going to the language school under Marcos. And, we, and by around the end of it, we were getting ready to graduate. And Marcos says, you know, I don't think I've ever asked you this before, but you guys are getting ready uh, to, to graduate. He goes, what do, you, what do you think God's calling you to do? I said, man, there's no question in my mind. We're moving back to Guanacaste. We're going to go back there. I, I know that God's called us, even though we had that horrible thing happen to us. I know there's a purpose and a reason in this. And he says, can I be honest with you? I said, sure, man. He goes, I don't want to offend you. I said, you're not going to offend me, man. And uh, he says, the last thing Costa Rica needs in Guanacaste is another American missionary. <laughs> he says, what happens is they get up there and they try to do everything that, the way you guys do it in the States, and it just doesn't work. He goes, the, the church has ended up dwindling and, and because it's just not their way. He goes, what those pastors need up there is someone to come alongside them and support them and equip them and help them to reach their people. He said, it's their people. It's not yours. It's their culture. He says, you're never going to be a Costa Rican. Why would you not want to equip the pastor's up there to reach their people. And man, when he said that, bells went off in my head. That just made perfect sense to me for some reason. Crazy thing is, we didn't know why we were there in Costa Rica. We just went, we knew we had to learn the language first, and then we figured this thing out. What are the chances that in 1998, somebody gives me the name of a guy? I totally disregard it, throw it away. Three years later, someone in San Jose gives me that same guy's number. God uses that guy to explain to me the need and what our ministry would ultimately become. You can't make that stuff up, man. You'd have a better chance of winning the lottery for something that to happen. Our ministry began, and we began to find churches out in the, in the middle of nowhere in Costa Rica, the most remote, little dirt floor churches out there. And we began to build relationships with them. We began to start and adopt a church program to where uh, the churches in Costa Rica, we would hook them up with a church in the state so they could support them. Get them Bibles, Sunday school material, discipleship, build buildings for them, build churches for them. And this thing just started blowing up. You know what? It's still going on today, even though I'm not even a part of it anymore. <laughs> Peter goes on to explain to us in verse 7. He says our trials are sent to us in order to test us. Look at verse 7. Look at the phrase tested genuineness which means to test something in order to prove that it will not fail. Verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, God wants to prove your faith is gen genuine. No, there's no question about that. God already knows the depth of your faith, by the way, but he wants to grow us. He wants to test us. He wants us to see, and he wants us to learn, and he wants others to witness it. See, trials provide the most reliable source for proof. And we may sound all spiritual when things are going good. I'm blessed. We'll make T-shirts. I'm blessed. License plates. I'm blessed. I see it all the time. But, but what about when you're in the pressure cooker of life and things are heating up? So much to the point that things are beginning to come unglued. How do you handle that? That's the question we need to look at. Because God proves our faith to us. He not only proves it to us, but he proves it to our loved ones. And he also proves it to a watching world out there, guys. Because outside these four walls, there are millions of people that watch the way Christians live. And they may not understand or even agree with everything that we believe, but they are sure profoundly moved when a believer's faith remains when he's going through even the worst of life moments. By that, they will know our faith is real. And by that, it will draw them one step closer to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. This is how it works, guys. You lost your job. I want to put this up on the screen for you. You lost your job, but you gain a resilient faith. You lost your health, but you gain a patient faith. You lose a loved one, but you gain a grieving faith with the hope and the assurance that one day, if they're a believer, you're going to see them again. You see, guys, hard times just make strong believers. There simply is no other way. I'll end with this to prove my point, that joy and trials go together. James chapter 1, 
verses 2 and 3. It's the verse I told you about that I found when I was going through that in Costa Rica. It said, my brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. There simply is no other way. You see, joy and trial, they're inexplicably knitted together. They belong together. There just simply is no other way to produce the endurance that God requires of his kids. Salvation is free. It costs us nothing. But following Jesus at times may cost us something. But you know what? God is worth it. He is so worth it. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, we come to you. And God, we pray that your word, Father, has just met somebody in this congregation right where they're at to give them hope, to give them encouragement, God. But, Lord, not only that, God, I pray, Father, Lord, if there's anyone here that has never trusted you as Lord and Savior, God, that you would use your word to sow into their lives, to plant a seed in their life today. God, would you draw them close to you? Would you let them sense just how real you really are and that you do care for us? Lord, we thank you for your word, and we praise you for it. So, Lord, would you take it and help us to apply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the invitation is this. Amen. Give God a hand. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, I'm going to be right down here at the front. I'm not going to call you forward because I've gone a little bit long. But I, you know, I'd love the opportunity to tell you how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I'll be happy to do that. If you need prayer, I'll be down there in a minute. But if you're new to Journey Church, I would love to meet you. For the rest of you, have a great weekend, guys. Thank you so much.